this episode was pre-recorded as part of a live continuing education webinar. On-demand CEUs are still available for this presentation through all CEUs. Register at allceus.com slash counselor toolbox. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's presentation on grief. Today we're going to be talking about the consequences of grief and interventions that we might be able to use to help people move through the grieving process. I am your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. We're going to define grief, conceptualize it in terms of any loss, identify how failure to deal with grief can impact a person, and explore the stages of grief and interventions that might be appropriate. Now, this is not going to be a super creative art therapy sort of thing. We're really talking about tasks today. Um, I did recently put out two videos on our YouTube channel, I'll See You Use Education, that explores a variety of different art therapy techniques that you can take a look at if you're interested in you know, trying to stoke those creative juices. Grief is a label assigned to all of the emotions associated with dealing with any kind of loss. And a lot of times when we talk about grief, we think about death. And yes, death is definitely something we grieve. But we also grieve other things. And that grief may be lesser on in, in intensity or greater in intensity depending on what the thing is or was and how important it was to us we can lose things and we can grieve um, if you lose your grandmother's wedding ring that you had you may grieve the loss of that and be upset about it for you know a while i don't know how long you would be upset but um, and that's a thing but that also represents a memory and something important to you we can lose abilities as we get older, we lose certain abilities. I can't do some of the things I did when I was 20 anymore, and it really frustrates the heck out of me. Um, I'm, I'm stuck in that anger stage, I'll admit. But it's important to recognize that we do lose abilities, and people who experience um, injuries, and they may lose functioning if they have strokes, that may cause a loss of abilities, any sort of physical, functional, or cognitive abilities, we're going to grieve the loss of. As people develop uh, symptoms or become more symptomatic in Parkinson's, I watched it with my grandfather. Um, he was still cognitively sharp as a tack, but he began shaking a lot. He had the tremors, and his best favorite hobby was making miniature dollhouse furniture, and you can't do that when you've got the tremors and that really was devastating to him um, his other hobby or and career was painting he was a house painter and obviously with tremors you can't paint and get those sharp clear lines like he was oh he drilled that into my head um, we can also lose freedoms our ability to get from one place to another when people go on oxygen um, and they've improved the oxygen delivery systems a lot but, you know, back in the day, if somebody had to be on 24-hour oxygen, it would reflect in their freedom, their ability to move around. We also, when we talk about freedoms, and this is more under social than physical, but since it triggered in my memory, when we lose particular freedoms, you know, the freedom to... Uh, vote the freedom to whatever when we feel like we lose particular cultural freedoms we can also experience grief in terms of self-concept we can grieve when we lose a role think about empty nest um, you don't become or when your children move out you're not not a caregiver anymore you're still a caregiver but it's in a different way and that role of being a 24 7 caregiver has changed it, when people retire and they are no longer going to that job every day they see themselves as a retiree now not as a whatever they used to do for their career and they may grieve the loss of that role they're not sure who they are when people get divorced or whatever happens and they lose one of their roles they are no longer that 
they no longer have that function. I don't want to say they're no longer that person because each one of our roles is only a part of who we are. But it's something to be grieved. From a worldview, uh, we can lose our innocence and we can lose our sense of safety when we are victimized, when things happen that we feel powerless against. And this can be victims of crime. This can be um, natural disasters. There are a lot of different things that can affect our worldview that may kind of shock us and we lose our sense of safety and security in our where we're at. Or it may alter our worldview by changing our sense of innocence in terms of, you know, you may have thought of everybody as good and forward moving and benevolent and something happens and all of a sudden you're like, crap, well, that doesn't work. And you're having to grieve the loss of your worldview. Dreams, how things should be. You know, a lot of us have dreams. We had dreams when we were little. We have dreams now. And if something happens and we get to the point where we recognize that that dream is just not going to come true, then we may have to grieve it. I remember when I was, from the time I was knee high to a grasshopper, I thought I was going to be a doctor, a medical doctor. And, you know, lo and behold, I got into college and I recognized that calculus and organic chemistry were not my thing. And that probably was not going to be the path that I was going to end up being successful on. And that took a while. That was a bitter pill to swallow for me. And, you know, I grieved the loss of that dream. I took it and I moved into acceptance and funneling that energy into something else. And socially, we can lose relationships. We can lose best friends. We can lose loved one. you know, relationships with, with uh, significant others, you know, we can break up. There are a lot of things that can happen that aren't death specifically. We also want to grieve, and this isn't as much of an issue now with the internet, but it is still somewhat of an issue. When we move, you may have that best friend that lives in your neighborhood or down the street that you just hang out with all the time, that's the person that you rely on, you enjoy spending time with, and then you get transferred. Well, that can be grief provoking because not only are you leaving that neighborhood and that community that you know but you're leaving your best friend people who are in the military experience this a lot because they transfer about every two years and they learn to deal with it but there is a grief process when life changes stages of grief now we're going back to the old um uh, basic stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and accept acceptance. In denial, people often feel numb. They feel like it's a dream. They feel sort of surreal, and they try to find alternate explanations or engage in some magical thinking. This isn't happening. It's, it's a bad dream. I'll wake up tomorrow, and everything will be fine. Anger. Well, people get angry when things happen, when their worldview changes, when they lose something, they don't know what to expect next. And generally, the loss was not expected. So, you know, there's the unknown, a sense of loss of control. Even in when somebody is diagnosed with a terminal illness, for example, when they are diagnosed, they often feel a sense of anger and terror and grief about what's happened, what the unknown is, the loss of control, you know, yada, yada. And there's also anger towards fears of death, isolation, and, and failure. And it's important to recognize that anger has a protective function. You know, suddenly your world is out of control. That's what happens when whatever occurred that's causing the grief, pr grieving process Anger is one way, that fight or flight, that you are trying to regain control and regain mastery and get regrounded. Anger makes sense. You know, it, some people feel more anxiety than anger, but either way, it makes sense from a uh, functional point of view. Bargaining is the next step. If I do this, that, and the other, then I'll wake up and realize this was only a bad dream. If I 
follow the, all of the doctor's uh, directions and I go to church every single day while I'm in chemo, then this can cancer will be gone. You know, there's a lot of bargaining that can happen. With parents, if they have a child who is sick, a lot of times parents bargain and they're like, if I could only have that and spare my child. Then people move into depression, and this is not necessarily linear. You know, I see a lot of people jump around. We don't want to assume that this is going to be a nice linear one-way thing. They'll hit depression, then may bounce back to anger, and then bounce back up to depression for a while until they finally move on into that acceptance. Depression is characterized by a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. This is when it really hits the person this really happened there's nothing i can do about it something that was meaningful to me is now gone and i can't get it back i'm powerless to get that back and we need to help people during this phase regain their sense of hope about something as well as their sense of personal power about what they do have control over we're going to talk about that more and finally acceptance is the final stage and acceptance is such a challenging word for a lot of people that are experiencing grief um, radical acceptance involves realizing that the loss occurred and determining how to proceed from there this is happening it is what it is it's real now how do i proceed from here acceptance also means recognizing what happened and still being able to envision the future again we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the presentation the biopsychosocial impact of grief um, there are articles in your uh, classroom that go over in depth on all this stuff but basically let's hit the highlights biologically when people are grieving their hpa axis is ramped up because all of a sudden something was taken from them they're grieving and they're feeling stress so they're going to experience sleep disturbances changes in weight increased blood pressure increased cortisol and other endocrine changes and potentially muscle weakness this is not surprising um, the increased cortisol and other endocrine changes i do want to focus on for just a second uh, because especially people who have diabetes they can find it more difficult to control their blood sugar during times of stress and grief because their cortisol levels are higher which means that their body's trying to secrete more um, glucose into their system on a regular basis when that happens when that glucose is constantly being drawn out of the muscles to or drawn into the system the muscles may not have enough glycogen stores and they may that may contribute to feelings of just muscle weakness like oh my gosh i don't feel like i can lift that 40 pound bag of dog food like i used to <clears throat> there are other changes that happen chronic headaches and are another thing to remember a lot of times stress causes headaches and when people are grieving they're under stress another impact of grief and i know this is out of order but it looked better on the powerpoint to do social next is social um, when people are experiencing grief they tend it doesn't always happen but they tend to go to one of two extremes there may be withdrawal withdrawal and social isolation i don't want to get close to anybody i am overwhelmed i can't deal with anything anymore i don't want to be reminded of it to the other aspect or the other end of the spectrum of what i call enmeshment where people are so um worried are so fearful that their loved ones are going to disappear or their stuff is going to disappear um or whatever it was that happened that they're grieving that they consume themselves with looming over what they still have it's like i'm going to keep an eye on you if it's a child you know they may want to stay real close to that child to make sure that nothing bad happens to to him or her if it's stuff you know if they their house is broken into they may become um obsessed is not the word i'm really looking for but they may become extremely focused on keeping their house safe and trying to make their world safe again and that may be an almost 
um, singular focus that they experienced for a while. Psychologically, people run the gamut. Depression is one. Um, obviously, we talked about that denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Anxiety. People, anxiety is the flight part of the fight or flight reaction. People have a lot of fears when things happen. Not necessarily because of the primary loss, but sometimes because of secondary losses. If a person's been married, for, my grandmother went through this. She was married to my grandfather for 30 some odd years, and he always took care of everything, and he paid the bills, and that, that was what he did. And when he passed away, not only did she lose her best friend and her confidant and the person who'd been by her side for, you know, 40 years, but she also um, lost the person who took care of the bills and took care of making sure that there was money coming in and, you know, balanced, the, did all the stuff. You know, she was very, um, she embraced that very traditional 1950s female role. And that's what she knew how to do and she felt comfortable doing and all of a sudden she's having to do what he did too and she felt very anxious about that she lost so much in that one incident when he passed away people may also experience a sense of relief and a lot of times they don't want to talk about this because they feel guilty for feeling relieved and you know i mentioned this in a couple classes ago that when both of my parents passed away they both had cancer and towards the end they were both suffering greatly and it was a relief to me in many ways when they finally did pass because they weren't hurting anymore but nobody wants to talk about relief they want to talk about grief and sadness and devastation and it's important to tell people it's okay to feel a sense of relief um, there are changes in worldview when grief happens. Even if it's something like cancer, you can see, uh, you know, good people get cancer and pass away. And you're like, why did this happen? That doesn't make any sense in my worldview. Good people are supposed to be able to be around and populate the earth. Uh, when bad things happen to you. You know, maybe your house burns down and you're like, I have done everything right. I am a nice person. I turned off all the elect, you know, I turned off the burners and stuff. How could this happen? My worldview that life was predictable is suddenly obliterated. <clears throat> People can have lots of different types of guilt. And we're going to talk about a few. Um, there's the general guilt of I should have done this for that per this person or I should have done this, or I shouldn't have done this, or I regret not saying something to somebody before they passed away. But there's also survivor guilt. And when I say survivor guilt, that can happen with, with death, of course, but that can also happen in situations where someone is injured. Maybe you're in a car accident and someone is injured and loses some sort of functional ability. They experience losses as a result of that car accident, and you don't. And the other people in the car who didn't experience such devastating injuries may feel guilty that they are still as functional as they were before the car accident, and the other person's not. Uh, so there can be survivor or survivability guilt that people experience, especially if they perceive that they are the cause of the other person's injuries, such as they were driving the car when they got into that car accident and the passenger was injured. The driver of the car may feel high levels of guilt for not only causing the problem, but also for remaining able-bodied. There can be difficulty concentrating. When our HPA axis is activated, when we're not sleeping well, we're not going to concentrate well. People are in crisis when they're in grief. They are trying to adjust to their new normal. Encourage them to write things down. Give themselves time. Eliminate distractions as much as possible when they do have to concentrate. And take advantage of those times when they do feel alert and 
able to focus right after my mom died there was about three months there where you know it was kind of hit or miss when i came to the office if if i felt like i was going to be able to um focus long enough to write a course or do something and it was important for me during that time for me it helped to chunk things and say okay i'm going to work on this for 20 or 30 minutes and then i'm going to go do something else because i knew i didn't have the cognitive wherewithal to do a two or three hour writing session people may have difficulty making decisions because they're not sure i mean this their life was turned upside down and they're not sure of the impact of their decisions now uh, so they may be challenged if they're moving you know they got transferred and they're moving somewhere making a decision about where to live next you may not think of that as a grief reaction but they're moving to a new place and they may have to make decisions about what they're how they're going to find new friends and there's lots of stuff they need to do and they may just not be ready to do that because they're afraid since they can't anticipate anything right now that they may make the wrong decision and that's okay encouraging them to get social support for those decisions that have to be made and delaying any decisions that they don't have to make right now and and recognizing that in large part most decisions are not permanent you know there are some that are permanent but a lot of times if you make a decision like you know where you're gonna live you can always move it's a headache but you could move um, if you make a decision about you know how you're going to handle certain things okay you know you maybe try to implement those strategies right now and if they don't work out so well that's fine you know, you can regroup and go a different way and avoidance of triggers some people after a grief after they lose something they may avoid triggers and there's lots of them you know you want to think with all your senses visual triggers auditory triggers smells you know if it's a person that you lost you may smell their cologne on somebody else and it may trigger you uh, different things i know for myself um, over the past year getting used to my mom not being here my daughter started driving um, she's graduating uh, high school at the end of this semester there are a lot of big milestones in my daughter's life that my mom's not going to be around for that every time one of those happens i'm like i keep wanting to call her and i'm like well, i can't do that uh, and i didn't anticipate that i anticipated the anniversaries i anticipated the holidays but i didn't anticipate milestones in my kids lives remind being a trigger for the grief of the loss of my mom it's important for people to be mindful and aware of what is triggering for them so they can address it doesn't mean you can avoid it um, but it can allow you to understand or can allow the person to understand why they are feeling more emotional and and we do want to let people know or educate them about grief bursts some sometimes it's called so you may be thinking that you're doing fine and you know two three months goes by and you're not having any problems and you feel like you got this you've coped with it you've dealt with it and then all of a sudden something happens and you become really emotional and that's okay that's your body is still adjusting and they say that uncomplicated grief usually takes two to three years for the person to actually fully work through and integrate and move on to acceptance the first year is generally the toughest um, and then after about three years if the person is still having difficulty integrating it we're looking at more complicated grief exacerbating and mitigating factors how people react in a crisis when something bad happens how close the situation was to them if it is a co-worker at work who gets is diagnosed with cancer then the grief there may be some shock and some sadness um, and some grief but it may not be the same intensity as if your child or your parent 
was diagnosed with cancer or if the situation happened to you your house burned down your grief reaction and your trauma reaction would probably be more intense than if a family member's house burned down you know hopefully that would wouldn't happen but we know fires occur the person's grief and their ability to integrate the grief and move through those stages also is affected by how many other stressors the person experienced in the last year if they are already worn down and their cortisol levels are already bottoming out then they are more likely to develop trauma symptoms in reaction to a grief promoting event if they had mental health issues and ineffective coping skills then that may impact their ability to deal with the grief if they have adequate social supports that is going to go a long way to helping people work through the grief but what adequate looks like for people differs not everybody wants to be surrounded by 15 family members for the first month after a loss you know we need to identify what that looks like for them their understanding of the loss is going to also alter their reaction to the grief process if they understand it as um, something that was anticipated or if they see it in a way that makes sense in their worldview that's going to be a lot easier than if it's something that just hits them out of left field how much control or responsibility they feel like they had in the situation also can affect their grief when you're working with parents who've experienced sudden infant death syndrome there is a lot of grief that goes around and the parents often feel a whole lot of guilt and responsibility because they feel like they should have hear those words there emotional reasoning and the should they feel like they should have been able to prevent it and that can make it a lot harder if they're they keep going over it a hundred times or a child that gets abducted you know that's another problem or another grief promoting thing because the person's sense of safety in their environment is lost they have to grieve the fact that even if they get their kid back that this happened and they may not feel as a result of it they may have lost their sense of being a good parent they may have lost their sense of being safe in their environment they may have lost you know there's probably lots of losses and we need to help them examine those things the type of loss and the predictability of the loss also affects it if somebody is diagnosed for example with a terminal illness um, a lot of times that starts out as anticipatory grief because you find out and then you've got a while while they're going through you know treatment or, or whatever they decide to do before the person actually dies so there's a time for people to put their proverbial ducks in a row if you will and that can make it easier because people have a, loved ones have a chance to say goodbye and come to terms with it in a certain manner as opposed to if somebody has a heart attack in their sleep you know that say oh my gosh you know wasn't expecting that and it may feel a lot scarier to people and the age of the bereaved children have a whole different concept of life and death and loss and grief and all this stuff we need to help children move through these stages and especially address their any um, symptoms of magical thinking you know if i say my prayers every night then this will make mommy better or, or whatever the case may be we need to work with children to help them understand what they can and cannot control most people if they have unresolved grief may get stuck in anger guilt or depression um, they don't usually get stuck in bargaining sometimes they'll jump back all the way to denial and they will just pretend it didn't exist with anger the person may be repeating to themselves and their internal voices may be going through a lot of shoulda couldas and if onlys if only i would have 
encouraged him to go to the doctor sooner. If only I would have double checked the stove. If only I would have, you see where we're going with this. Uh, <clears throat> they may be angry at themselves for things they think they should have or shouldn't have done. They may be angry at other people for things that they think those other people should or shouldn't have done. And when something happens that causes us a loss, a lot of times we want to assign blame because that helps us get control. If it's that person's fault, then that's easier to control than to say wrong place, wrong time. Um, <clears throat> so there can be angry at others. There can be angry at the person who died for leaving them, for abandoning them. There can be anger at a higher power if the person believes in higher powers for letting that happen. There's a plenty of anger to go around. And we want people to explore that and recognize it and not pathologize it. Who are you angry at? What do you feel guilty for? Who do you resent? You know, let's use all those different anger terms and get those things out there. There can also be jealousy that comes out. And, you know, that's another form of anger. If you are a survivor and you know, survivor of a car accident, I'm going to try to keep away from as many death metaphors as possible because we talk about death all the time in terms of grief. But if you are a survivor of a car accident and you have lost physical abilities as a result of that car accident. You may be jealous of other people who still have those abilities. So that anger is still there, that anger that you lost your physical capabilities. And depression, you know, people who feel hopeless and helpless and they don't know how to go on. They're kind of stuck. They're like, I don't know. I, I don't know what to do with this. I have this grief. I have this loss. I have this stuff that I'm sitting here holding, and I don't know what to do with it. And we want to help people, as I said earlier, work toward developing hope and personal empowerment with what they can change. Denial is the mind's way of protecting people from what lies ahead. And what lies ahead is the awareness that crap that i couldn't predict that that means there are other things in this world that i can't predict and that means that's scary that's terrifying to me and as joseph brings up unfortunately this fault comes right on the heels of kobe bryant's death he had gone to church that morning and had his daughter in the helicopter and they were getting going off to some something i don't know what they were doing but he had no idea that this was going to happen. And, you know, by all rights, he was a really good human being. And you're looking at it going, why? What is the sense in that? And <clears throat> so that can make it really hard to accept that that really happened. And, you know, right now you keep seeing the stories online and on the TV looking at this crash and trying to figure out how to blame someone or something for this happening. Denial, you know, let's get back to denial, can start before the actual loss as in the case of a ter terminal illness when you've got anticipatory grief. So what do we need to do or what can we do? We need to assess the person's level of acceptance and denial or accept, sorry, Assess the level of acceptance and denial of each person in the support system. You have your theoretical identified patient who's grieving, but you also have all of their supports. And those people are also probably grieving. And it's important to understand where people are in their grief process because they're going to interact differently with one another. If one person's at acceptance and the other person is in anger, then they may end up clashing and have some animosity with each other when the person who's accepted the loss is going, why can't you just let it go and move on? And the person who's angry is saying, how can you possibly let it go? This is so unjust. You, you want to assess, you know, the whole support system as much as you can. We want to also discuss hope and acceptance. We can have hope in our life and accept that a loss is 
has occurred. I can accept that I've had a, an injury that has taken away some of my physical abilities, and I can have hope for a rich and meaningful life, even though I have that disability now. I can accept that my loved one has died, but I can have hope, or and I can have hope, that I can have a rich and meaningful life without them being physically there, but still present in my memories. Yeah. So you want to discuss that radical acceptance and in, in acceptance and commitment therapy. He talks about the living in the and. You can grieve, you can experience this loss, and you can still have a rich and meaningful existence. Action strategies. We want to help people shore up their resources, you know, social supports, whatever they need at that point in time. When people are in the really early stages of grief they are going to need all kinds of resources we need to make sure think of maslow that they're getting their biological needs met and they may have all the food in the world in the house but if they're not eating it it ain't doing any good uh, my uh, stepfather after my mother passed he didn't doesn't cook at all and there was all this food and he would just forget to eat he wasn't hungry he'd forget to eat um, he also, you know, wasn't a grocery shopper. So when food started running low, you know, it was, he didn't know where to go, what to get. He felt very flummoxed at just the concept of trying to have to take that over. Very bright man, but he was so overwhelmed with his grief at that point. He wasn't able to engage in a lot of those very basic um, activities to keep himself functioning. Uh, so it's important to shore up resources. What do you need to make sure that you are feeling as safe as you can, eating as well and as nutritiously as you can, getting sleep the best quality that you can, you know, see where we're going. We're not looking for perfection. We're looking to try to mitigate those vulnerabilities. And what other things do you need? People, after a fire, you know, they may need all new clothes because their clothes are done. They're, they're ashes. They may need um, housing. They may need assistance you know, enrolling in a new school because the shelter that they're staying at is not in the same district. We also need to um, pay attention to those things. <clears throat> we need to gather accurate information for the person. If they are diagnosed with a terminal disease, Help them get accurate information to help them move through this denial so it's not so scary and they can start peeking and going, okay, maybe I can take a quick look. <clears throat> if it is after a fire, you know, accurate information might be information about what happened in that fire. After someone passes away, sometimes people want to know, did they suffer? That's one of the first questions that a lot of people ask. And accurate information can help people get through that. <clears throat> don't give them information they don't want. People will ask for the information that they want. You don't want to overwhelm them and kind of rip the Band-Aid off for them. That's, that's not cool. And when they are ready, they can start looking at facing the loss. And narrative therapy is super helpful for this because it puts it out there. It's not me telling you about what's going on, but it is me, the, the client, writing about, okay, this is what happened. This is the story. And you can use the same names. You can use different names, but you want them to, you know, write out what happened. And since they're doing that, it's, it, it, it just helps them separate from those emotions and get out what's going on. Then they can go back and read it. Um, uh, Trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy is a perfect example of narrative therapy and helping people start telling their story and integrating it into their lives. Anger, remember, is a power play. It pushes people away to avoid getting hurt again. It pushes people away to keep them from overwhelming you. It may blame others as an outlet for helplessness. Somebody somewhere could have prevented this. There's no reason this had to happen, so I need to blame somebody. 
They may blame themselves to try to regain some control or prevent it from happening again or make themselves suffer. Um, people who have that survivor guilt may blame themselves for what happened because they feel guilty for coming out unscathed. We want to explore that with them. And anger may encourage people to question their belief system and world schema. They need to make sense of it so they're not threatened again. So they are safer than they were before. They need to learn from this. Remember, guilt is a form of anger. We've talked about that. Action steps. Have people identify their primary and secondary losses. The primary loss was, you know, the loss of the person or the loss of the house or the loss of the pet. That was the primary thing. But what else did you lose as a result of that? And going through all of those losses that we talked about on the first slide, did you lose anything else physically? You know, maybe if the breadwinner, a 45-year-old father of five, has a heart attack and passes away, and he is the primary breadwinner, um, the, his spouse stayed home, homeschooled the children, and hadn't had a job in 15 years. Okay. So after that happens, not only did mom lose her partner, her spouse, the love of her life, but she also lost the primary breadwinner, which means they may not be able to afford that house anymore. So they may lose the house, which means they may need to move. So they lose their community, which also means they may um, have to switch schools. You know, you can follow this out to its final conclusion, but you can see that it's not just the loss of a person. It's the loss of a whole bunch more. And that has a lot of ripple effects because community, for example, is what's there for social support. So if as part of the losses as a result of the primary loss, you lose your social support, oh my gosh, that's like a double whammy right there. We want to explore what the losses mean to the person. If they lose their job, you know, they get fired from a job and it was, they thought that that was the career that they were going to, you know, have for the rest of their life. That can be devastating to them. When people retire or when they're forced to retire, even worse, that's even more of a grief promoting thing. You know, exploring what that means to them, that they are no longer a, you know, a couple of my friends just recently retired from the military. So they are no longer active duty soldiers. They will always be soldiers, but they are no longer active duty soldiers. And that is huge to them. Cops go through the same thing. A lot of cops, when they retire, they're like, I don't know. I've been a cop for 20 years. I don't know what I am if I'm not out there on patrol or doing whatever I did. We want to explore that with them. How do they feel about that loss? What are they angry about? because of that loss? What are they scared about because of that loss? And what do they feel helpless and hopeless about because of that loss? We also, in this stage, want to allow time for ventilation and validation. Anger is a natural emotion. And I'm not going to tell people they shouldn't have anger. So it's important to help them um, identify that feeling. And if they feel like they want to scream for a second, okay. I had a client when I was in, uh, in Florida who was in treatment with us, and unfortunately, she was diagnosed with a really aggressive form of breast cancer, and she was very angry, very, very angry, and I, I get it, but she wasn't expressing that anger. She was very buttoned down about it, and, and anyway, long story short, we ended up having a talk, and she says, I can't. I, I am just enraged, and I can't let it go because I have no privacy around here, and I don't want to overwhelm anybody, scare anybody, and I don't want anybody's pity. And I, okay. So I ended up making a, a call over to our crisis stabilization unit where they had rooms that they used for seclusion and restraint, and it would be a safe place for her to go and yell and scream and do whatever she wanted to do. Um, for a few minutes and just get it out. And I said, is this something that you think might be helpful? And she said, yes. And I said, all righty. So we made it happen. And 
yeah, she let it, let it rip for about 15, 20 minutes until she was just exhausted. And she sat down on the floor and she finally started to cry. Not everybody cries when they grieve. She happened to, but it was important for her to get past that anger and in order to get down to those more threatening feelings for her. Ventilate, validate. It is okay to scream sometimes. Um, and, you know, it's just all about when and where you do it, going back to that whole context thing. We want to examine any of their cognitive distortions, like all or none thinking. You know, everybody I know gets cancer. Nobody that I know has ever gone through anything this bad. You know, looking for those and helping them challenge that reasoning with facts. Emotional reasoning. I am angry that this is happening. Therefore, somebody must be able to be blamed. If I feel angry, then I means that I should be, there's somebody to be angry at. There's something to be angry at. The fallacy of fairness. And we talked about that a couple of times. The fact that you know, sometimes it can be the best person in the whole world who has, you know, eaten a nutritious diet, never smoked, never drank, never cussed, and they have an aneurysm. I mean, it just happens. Life is not fair sometimes. And we want to help people understand that. But at the same time, once they start exploring that, that can also increase their anxiety because they're like, well, you know, if I if I lived my life by fairness, then if I'm a good person, then good things will happen to me and I'll live a long and happy life and da-da-da-da. That doesn't happen. So that's really scary to me to anticipate or to know that I can't anticipate what might happen. Um, and begin exploring solutions to fears and issues. What is within their control? With my kids, you know, using the example of my mother passing away. I am sad that that happened. My father passed away before my daughter was even born. And, you know, that was, that's very disheartening and devastating to me that she didn't get to know him as a person, but she still gets to know him as through what he taught me. And you know, when things come up around the house, I, I'll say something like, you know, Papa Ron would have said, or Papa Ron used to, and we talk about my father and my memories of my father to help instill in them the things that I think are important that he instilled in me and they get a sense of who he was. I can't bring him back, but I can keep his memory and his lessons and his legacy alive. But that's, you know, how I do it. Um, we do want to help people explore what's within their control. If their house burned down, well, they can't get their house back, but they can, they eventually will get a new house. They can choose where to, to live you know they don't want to stay in a shelter forever so the first step that's within their control might be figuring out okay how do i move from this temporary shelter to the next permanent um uh, the next permanent step bargaining if i do x y and z maybe i can wake up and it'll have been a nightmare i think we've all been there before <laughs> contributes to depression because the person wakes up every morning hoping that the reality is different and every morning their hope is squelched. It's like, crap, this is real. Um, we want to encourage people to start developing hope for the new reality, living in the and, accepting that they can grieve and experience the loss and still have a rich and meaningful life. Um, if they're diagnosed with cancer, you know, they don't know if the chemo is going to work. They don't know what the prognosis is necessarily. Or maybe they do, but they're not dead yet. And they can grieve having this diagnosis and still have a rich and meaningful life for as much time as they've got. And a lot of, you know, treatments for diseases, not just cancer, have come so far, whether it's Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or, or cancer. And it's important for people to be able to grieve that diagnosis and, you know, what that means to them, but also recognize what time they have left and try to figure out how they want to embrace it. How do they want that narrative to work? Help clients stay in their present reality, not get too far ahead of them, not thinking about, you know, 
six months from now when I am on uh, um, confined to the bed, we want them to stay in the present. What can you do to use your energy to have the richest, more, most meaningful life today? Examine how bargaining just creates more exhaustion and frustration. You know, it's not doing you any good to sit there and try to, to make deals. What can you do? What is within your power? Some people feel like if they make a deal with their higher power that, you know, things will happen. Okay. You know, if you want to do that, but what else can you do in addition to that, that can help you have that life that you want? Validate people's wants. You know, I want to not have cancer. I want to have whatever I lost back. That is, you know, I get it. Um, we want to validate those wants, but we also want to educate them about their realities, including personal responsibility. And what I mean by that is sometimes we don't have the ability to change anything. Children often feel a great amount of responsibility for their parents. They think that if their parents are ill or depressed or anxious or whatever, um, that somehow it's their fault. And we need to make sure that people understand what, if anything, their part was, was in this. And a lot of times it's, they're taking on more responsibility and more self-blame than is accurate. So we do want to make sure, especially with children, to educate them about what's going on and what they do have control over. A child cannot make cancer go away. A child with cancer cannot make that cancer go away, but they can follow the doctor's orders and get a good night's sleep and eat the food they're supposed to and take their medicine and whatever. Hopelessness and helplessness occurs when the reality that the loss has occurred sets in and it can't be changed. You're just like, wow, that, that happened. And then that, wow. We want to help people develop hope and empowerment, exploring all aspects of the life to which they are committed. If you lost this aspect, you were forced into retirement, and now you lost that aspect of your life, you're no longer a soldier or a cop or whatever it was, you can grieve that. You know, you have that to grieve. What else in your life makes it rich and meaningful? Because my guess is that was not your soul and entire life. Explore how they can use their energy to continue to nurture the important things in their life. After the loss of a child, we see a lot of people experience, you know, intense grief. And, you know, I can't imagine the grief that they're experiencing. In some cases, you know, if you've got a family that has lost a child and there are two other children in the household, they also still need to devote, they have energy and they can be committed to those remaining children. They can be committed to their relationship with their partner. They can be committed to other things that are important to them. Yes, the loss of that child is devastating and some energy is going to go there. Encouraging them to also look at the things that they still are able to experience positively. Again, encourage knowledge acquisition. Identify what can and cannot be changed. You know, have them make a list of things if they need to in order to get clear in their head what their responsibility is and what will do any good. You know, using their energy to do something, you know, will it do any good? Acceptance means accepting the reality of the loss. We want people to explore how life will be different and the same since the loss. When we experience a loss, it generally doesn't mean we lose everything, always, everywhere. Uh, so we want to look at what's going to be the same. Your house burned down. That is devastating. You lost all your possessions. You lost your memories. Um, you lost your house. You may have to move. There's a lot of losses. However, you still have your friends. You still have your family. You still have your job. You still have, you know, the car that you were in, whatever it is. Um, encourage people to look at some of the things that are the same because that helps them reground to recognize that my entire life is not torn up like a tornado. There are still some things that I have that anchor me. Have them make a plan to change the things that they can. You know, here's where you're at right now. Where do you want to be? 
and how do we get there? If that loss can be prevented from recurring, encourage the person to take proactive steps like engaging in advocacy groups and um, looking at personal behaviors. Somebody who has a stroke, for example, maybe they had a stroke because their blood pressure got too high. Well, that might be preventable in the future, and they're going to have to deal with guilt about, you know, not preventing it sooner. But they can also be empowered to prevent having another stroke by learning to keep their blood pressure under control and those sorts of things. Grief is not a linear process. Most people experience grief surrounding a loss for at least a year, up to three years for uncomplicated grief. Holidays, anniversaries, and reminders are going to trigger that um, experience. And even for people, remember, who have been uh, survivors of crime, you know, there are a lot of triggers. When USA was running, I think it was USA, it was one of the channels that I watch, they were running these commercials, and I think they still are, I always turn them off, um, that I find very triggering because it's just a bunch of male actors saying boys will be boys and dismissing, you know, what happens in when someone is sexually assaulted. And those are the things that survivors hear right after they're assaulted, right after they're victimized. So hearing that, you know, not once, but like 15 times in the same 30 seconds, you know, yes, they end up with a different message, like things need to change or something. But that entire thing just puts people back in that place where they may have been right after they were victimized and hearing that experience invalidated. So it's important to remember that even things like television shows and commercials and music and smells can trigger memories. Many people will vacillate between depression and anger. It's important to normalize their experience and let them know, you know, you're going to have good days and you're going to have really bad days. That's okay. Let's make a plan to help you deal with the bad days and, you know, focus as much as you can on the good ones. Encourage them to reach out to supports, not only their family or social supports as they define them, but also support groups. You know, there are a lot of support groups of people who've gone through similar things, and that can be very helpful and validating to not feel quite so isolated. Make sure to address happiness and survivor guilt. It's okay to be happy, even though something bad has happened, you know. And a lot of times people feel guilty, not only for the relief that they experience if somebody passes on when they're suffering, but sometimes kids feel guilty for being happy if their family is going through something. And it's okay to be happy. You don't have to be devastated all the time. Um, and people experience grief in different ways. Not everybody's going to cry. We do want to validate that and use their... Um, the individual's language, as, as Andrew points out, when you're talking to them. If they're talking about sadness, then we'll talk about that. If they're talking about devastation or trauma or whatever words they're using, we want to try to join them in their expression. When someone's grieving, they're in a state of crisis. Encourage them to minimize vulnerabilities. By making lists, they're not going to be concentrating and remembering things well right now. Make lists, write things down, just accept that all your energy is going to coping with this grief and all the other stuff is going to have to be written down. Minimize demands unless staying busy helps. Some people would rather throw themselves headlong into something at first and that's the way their way of getting from their emotional mind into their rational mind. Keep a normal sleep routine. Set a defined amount of time to revisit the loss each day. Now, this doesn't mean you have to, but for people who tend to stay stuck and they're mulling it over and thinking about this loss all day, every day, encouraging them at a certain point to say, okay, I need to start devoting some of my energy to these other areas of my life that are meaningful. I will allow myself an hour or 30 minutes each day to 
sit with this feeling of grief and then I will move on. And that's very helpful for some people. So they have some parameters. They don't feel guilty for not grieving, but they also are able to give themselves permission to do something besides grieve. Encourage people to be compassionate with themselves. Losses encompass more than death of a person or property. Failure to acknowledge losses can cause unhelpful reactions in similar future situations. It's important to explore feelings and reactions in terms of their functionality. How are they benefiting the person? How does anger benefit the person? How does depression benefit the person in terms of helping them survive that moment and helping them try to protect themselves henceforth? It takes at least a year to deal with significant losses, and many times there are multiple ancillary losses that need to be addressed. How people deal with grief and loss varies widely, but we need to remember that grieving is a form of crisis. The body is on high alert, which impacts people's ability to sleep, their appetite, and their energy to work or socialize. Minimizing vulnerabilities is important to reduce unnecessary frustration and avoid confirming that sense of helplessness. We want to help people have the tools that they need to keep going and feel empowered and successful. Ultimately, it is hoped that the person can identify how they're stronger or better off from the experience. Between writing notes, filing insurance claims, and scheduling with clients, it can be hard to stay organized. That's why I recommend Therapy Notes. Their easy-to-use platform lets you manage your practice securely and efficiently. Visit TherapyNotes.com to get two free months of Therapy Notes by just using the promo code CEU when you sign up for a free trial at TherapyNotes.com. If this podcast helps you help your clients or yourself, please support us by purchasing your CEUs at allceus.com or getting your agency to sponsor an episode. A direct link to the on-demand CEUs for this podcast is at allceus.com slash podcast CEUs. That's allceus.com slash podcast CEUs. To sponsor an episode of Counselor Toolbox and reach over 50,000 clinicians per week, go to allceus.com slash sponsor. Thank you.